Okay, well, let's um, take a look at the text. We're looking at the final four verses of Romans chapter 15. And this is Paul's urging the Roman believers to pray for him so that his mission to Judea would be successful. And uh, again, gives us, I think, some instruction on how we ought to pray. So Paul writes to the church at Rome, Now I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints, so that I may come to you in joy by the will of God and find refreshing rest in your company. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. All right, well, this morning, remember, we saw by way of example what our Lord calls us to do, which is to serve one another. Remember, by God's grace, the Gentile believers in Macedonia, which are the churches of Philippi and Thessalonica, as well as those in Achaia, which uh, is primarily Corinth, wanted to help the Jewish believers in Judea who were impoverished because of Roman occupation and taxation, as well as the persecution of the unbelieving Jews. And even though the Macedonians and those from Achaia were uh, also afflicted and were also poor, they begged Paul to let them help. And they gave liberally. Paul says beyond their ability. I don't think they gave more than they had, but I think really more than they could really give without sacrificing something that was, I think, necessary for themselves. I think believing that God, of course, would, would make up the difference. But they wanted to minister to those uh, from whom they received the blessing, that they were ministered to indirectly because they were receiving these blessings meant for the Jews. They wanted to help the Jews who were in need. And Paul wanted to serve uh, these saints by taking the contribution to them in Judea, knowing that by doing so, humanly speaking, he would be taking his life into his own hands. Now in this, remember, the, in, in the church's example, in Paul's example, they were simply following the example that Jesus gave us, uh, who gave up the riches of heaven and became poor, became one with us, so that through his poverty we might be made rich. This is why we should also be willing to serve. And not just our neighbor in general, but our brethren in particular, this is what it means to be like Jesus. Okay? Uh, his character is not just something that amounts to a smile on our face or just being kind and friendly to other people but it also amounts to our serving like the Lord would serve or giving like our Lord would give and evangelizing as our Lord would evangelize. Now this evening we see another way in which we can serve each other, another way we can repay the debt of love that we owe the Lord Jesus Christ and that is we can pray for each other. Now Paul begins by urging the Roman believers to pray for him. If he was to carry out his plan successfully, he needed God's help, and so he begs for their prayers. That's what it, the word urge means. I urge you, I beg you, uh, pray for me. Now, God tells us in, in the Word, and we know very well as Calvinists, uh, we're very well aware of God's decree, right, his, his plan. Um, a plan that has been complete in his mind, actually it's eternally in his mind, from all eternity. It's not something he sat down and worked out at some particular time, but something that has, has been, you might say, an eternal idea, something that he has wanted to do always, one that includes absolutely everything that will actually come to pass in this world in creation, and we know because this is God's plan that nothing can change it and nothing can possibly change his mind, okay? What he has planned will take place, and yet the Lord commands us to pray, which almost seems contradictory, 
but, but it isn't. Prayer is one of the means that, that God has ordained to his ends. As a matter of fact, more often than not, I, I would suppose, he calls us to seek him before he does what he has planned or before he gives what he has promised he wants us to pray. Now, it's not that our prayers change his mind. You know, they, they don't. Again, his plan includes our prayers. God has predetermined, God has preordained that we would pray, that we would pray freely because that's what we want to do, and he has ordained that he would answer our prayers to bring his will to pass when we pray according to his will. Now, um, we might ask the question, why? I mean, if God is intending on doing what he's going to do anyway, why does it matter whether or not we actually pray? Well, we know that, you know, whatever God requires, he always has a very good reason. And I think the reason is this, that if he simply carried out his plan and gave all that he had promised without our having to seek him, then what reason would we have to seek him <laughs> for anything, really? Um, he's going to do it anyway, and it doesn't matter what we say. So we would just simply expect him to do it. Now, we would still worship him. We'd still worship him because we love him, but we would really never ask for what we need because we wouldn't need to do that. I think the reason he wants us to ask is so that we'll remember, first of all, that the blessing comes from him, that we'll remember that we're dependent upon him and that we need him, and that we'll remember to give him the glory, the credit, the honor uh, for the things that he actually does give us. Now, I know that sometimes as believers, perhaps we're not in the habit of asking the Lord for the things that we, that we need because we're so used to him providing those things, but he wants us to ask. Jesus says in the Lord's Prayer that we should pray, give us this day our daily bread. Give to us every day everything that we need in order to serve you by way of the Spirit, by way of physical health and strength, by way of material resources, in order that we might do what the Lord calls us to do. He wants us to seek him daily and to pray even for the necessities of life. Now, the Roman believers and we might have thought that Paul, of all people, would not need our prayers, okay? That they might have been thinking, you know, why should they pray for Paul? I mean, after all, he was the great apostle. He was the one the Lord was using essentially to evangelize the, the entire world. He's the one who risked his life on so many occasions, who even died once. I think it's, you know, it is believed that, that Paul, when he was stoned, um, outside of, was it Iconium and Lystra, he was dead. And maybe that's when he saw the vision that we read about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. But he was raised from the dead. And he, he did this, went through this in seeking to bring the gospel both to the Jews and the Gentiles. God was using him powerfully and mightily in doing these great things. So why would Paul need their prayers? Well, he did because all believers need his prayers, need, need prayer, need, you know, need the saints to pray for them. We should never think that anyone is beyond the need for prayer, not even the giants of the faith. You know, think about this. If we lived in the days of the, of the Romans, if we lived in the days of the apostles, would we have thought that we need to be praying for Paul or for Peter or for John? You know, moving a little bit further forward during the Reformation, now maybe we'd be a little bit more inclined to pray for these men, Luther, Zwingli, and Calvin, because we'd realize the danger they were in. But again, these guys are the supermen of prayer, and God is using them mightily. Do we really need to pray for them? Or in the time of the Puritans, John Bunyan, John Owen, Thomas Watson, or my particular favorites, Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield during the Great Awakening. And what about Charles Spurgeon? 
You know, ask yourself this question. When R.C. Sproul was still living, did you pray for him? Did I pray for him? And what about those still living? Sinclair Ferguson, Derek Thomas, Michael Reeves. I mean, we've been, we've been blessed by these men, haven't we? But have we been praying for them? You know, do these men really need our prayers? Don't we need their prayers? I mean, we do. But Paul is telling us here that they also need our prayers. Now, some of you may have heard this before, but there's a fairly well-known story about Spurgeon. It goes like this. A group of young ministers came one day to visit his church. After showing them the massive sanctuary, Spurgeon offered to show them his boiler room. I think I've heard Dick talking about the boiler room. The guests were not interested because boiler rooms were not pleasant places to visit. They were hot and dirty, usually located down in the basement. In Spurgeon's time, steam was the power source of the day. Boiler rooms were the powerhouses, the driving forces of everything. Spurgeon led the young ministers down to the basement where they found about 100 people in prayer. This, Spurgeon said with a smile, is my boiler room. Now, on another occasion, Spurgeon was asked about the secret of his extraordinary power in preaching, and his response was, my people pray for me. Now, Spurgeon knew that his success was dependent on the prayers of God's people, and so did Paul. Now, if they needed prayer, how much more do we need prayer? I mean, I need your prayers. I need you to pray for me so that I can do even what, what I'm doing here. We need to be praying for one another so that we might uh, serve the Lord. If we want to see the Lord bless our lives with useful service, we need to serve one another by praying for each other. Now, I want you to notice that Paul wasn't merely asking that they pray, but that they strive with him in prayer. Now, the word means to join with someone else in some severe efforts, in this case, to join in fervent, vigorous prayer. Now, this reminds us of a couple of things. First of all, that our Lord, when we pray, doesn't want us to pray with half a heart. doesn't want us to pray, you know, uh, as well as Jonathan Edwards talked about, the kind of affection that God desires in our lives is not the kind that barely moves us beyond a state of indifference. But He wants hot prayer. He wants zealous prayer. So the Lord doesn't want half-hearted prayer any more than He wants lukewarm hearts. If we're not interested in the things that we are asking of Him, He's not really interested in answering these prayers. James tells us in James 5, verse 16, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Now, as I read that translation, it, it didn't, you know, what is an effective prayer? And what does it mean that it can accomplish much? So digging into the language a little bit, I think a better translation might be this, the hearty prayer of a righteous man has powerful effects. Because that kind of prayer, of course, moves the hand that moves the world, so to speak. It's the kind of prayer that God will answer. And by the way, when James says that it's a righteous man, we know that the term is used generically. The Lord answers the prayer also of godly women, righteous women who are seeking Him heartily, as the ladies have already experienced. Now, the second thing this tells us is that they, as Paul asks them for prayer, is they don't necessarily need to be in the same place as he is to do this. Sometimes we think that we have to gather together in prayer before the prayers will be effective. But notice Paul had not yet been to Rome, and he wasn't going to go to Rome in order for them to strive with him in prayer. He wanted them to do that from where they were and where he was he asked them to pray with him. By faith, they could come before the same throne of grace, wherever they might be, and God would hear and answer them. Uh, as the hymn writer puts it, in the hymn we're going to sing at the close, as a matter of fact, uh, 
I had chosen this hymn before I thought of even including this in the sermon, but I thought, well, this is perfect. This verse speaks to this perfectly. There is a spot where spirits blend, where friend holds fellowship with friend. Though sundered far, by faith they meet around the common mercy seat. And what he's saying here, of course, is even though they might be separated by a great distance, um, they can still meet together by faith before the throne of God and strive together in their prayers. In this case, Paul and the Romans could do so for what it is he was asking. But now the next question is, how could they do this? You know, how does one generate this hearty prayer that accomplishes so much? Well, Paul actually gives us the answer to that in these few verses. Uh, first, he says, we have access, and we couldn't be able to do this. We couldn't unless we had it. He says, we have it by our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, he says, strive together with me. He, he, well, he exhorts them to pray by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit. So first of all, I think he's pointing to the mediation of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to know that when we come to the throne of grace, first of all, the door is open for us. We need to know that the Father hears us and He's going to respond to us and we know that He will because of what Jesus has done in His life and death, but also in what He continues to do in His heavenly mediation as He prays for us, intercedes for us. He has opened the door to the throne of grace. He's pleading for us. He's purifying our prayers. He is calling us to come freely and ask for what we will, knowing that this can give us confidence and boldness in our prayers. So Paul says, first of all, know that the Lord Jesus Christ, your mediator, has opened the door for you. You have confidence to come. So we need access, but the second thing we need is desire. We need desire to be able to pray heartily. That talks about with the heart, with affection. Well, Paul says we have that as well. By the love of the Spirit, the zeal and the affection that He gives to us for God, for Christ, for His kingdom, and for His glory. Remember, the, the blessing of the new covenant is the giving of the Holy Spirit who gives to us the power to uh, fulfill the commandments. Not perfectly. We like it to be perfect, but it's not perfect. But still, it, there's zeal there. And that, those commandments can be summarized by two things, love for God with all the heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love for our neighbor. So we have, by the, the power of the Holy Spirit, the love for God and the desire for His glory to be able to lift up these hearty prayers. Remember what we read in the meditation when Paul asked the prayer from the Ephesians. He said, pray, uh, pray. Well, he says, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. That doesn't mean just pray, but to pray in the Spirit, that means in reliance upon the Spirit, in, in the power of the Spirit, in the love that He gives. Remember, that the Spirit has poured the love of God into our hearts. He gives us the ability to pray heartily to the Lord, but we need to make sure, like everything else, that we don't take it for granted and it's going to happen automatically. If that were the case, we wouldn't have to ask for anything, right? But the Lord wants us to ask for everything, again, to show our dependence. So when we pray, we should ask for that help at least within our hearts, our desires lifting up to God, realizing we have this dependence. We may not need to necessarily need to verbalize it, but we do need to demonstrate to the Lord that we are dependent on the Spirit and on Christ in order to pray as we should pray. Okay, so Paul asked for them to strive together with him in prayer, but what is it he wanted prayer for? Well, he wanted them to pray that his mission would be a success. He says in verse 31, that I may be rescued from those who were disobedient in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints. Now, notice that Paul was going to um, 
you know, intrude, so to speak, or introduce himself into a situation that he knew was a dangerous situation. I'm going to go to Judea to deliver this contribution, but pray for me that I would be delivered from my enemies over there. Okay, remember that when Jesus, during his earthly ministry, was traveling, he often had to avoid Judea because the Jews there wanted to kill him. So he did avoid that area and, and sometimes would even go secretly into Judea for the feasts uh, and not publicly because of the open animosity and the desire of the Jews to, to kill him. And he did that until it was time for him to die because the, of the intense hatred of the Jews in that area, not surprisingly surrounding uh, the temple. Well, the same thing was true of Paul as well, wasn't it? Uh, Luke actually tells us that when Paul went to Judea and to Jerusalem on this occasion with the contribution from the Macedonian and Achaean churches, the Jews seized him in the temple, abused him. They, they were going to kill him. And then the Romans came and rescued him, but they arrested him. Um, and then when they wanted to move him from place to place, the Jews formed plots in order to kill him. So Paul, now notice, okay, this was a dangerous area. Paul's asking for prayer from the Romans that the Lord might deliver him from this. And, and I, I want us to see that God actually did answer that prayer, even though these things happened to Paul, because where did Paul uh, eventually go? To Rome, didn't he? Was he delivered from his enemies in, in Judea? He was. Now, sometimes God answers our prayers a little bit differently than we suppose that, that He might. Uh, even as He did here with Paul, He delivered Paul from the Jews, He brought him safely to Rome, but He did it as a prisoner of the Romans in order to protect him from the Jews. I'm not sure if Paul thought this was how God was going to do it, but um, it, at a certain point, He knew it was as He was heading in that direction. Now, secondly, he prayed that his service would be welcomed by the saints. And I thought that was interesting, that his service might prove acceptable to them. Why wouldn't it be if he's bringing a contribution of money to relieve the poverty of these uh, Jewish Christians? Uh, why would he want prayer that the Jewish believers would receive him and this contribution? Well, let's not forget that even the believing Jews in Jerusalem, in Judea, had some concerns about the Apostle Paul. Remember how when Paul comes to Jerusalem and James says, well, look, look, brother, there's a lot of Jews here who have believed, a lot of brothers, but they're concerned about you. They, they think that, that you are teaching the brethren everywhere to turn against the Mosaic traditions, and not just the Gentiles, but also the Jews. They've heard that you've come. You know, what's going to happen? Well, here, this is what I think you should do. And James counsels him, take these four men who are under a vow, pay their way into the temple, and then everyone will see that you're also walking according to the Mosaic traditions and you really have nothing against it. We need to remember that Jewish believers did have the liberty to keep their traditions as long as they did not rely on those things for their justification, for their standing before God. They didn't need those things to be accepted by God. That's why they told the Gentiles, you don't have to become Jews before you can be saved. You just need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So one of the problems they had with Paul was they thought he was teaching the Jewish brethren to forsake the traditions. So pray for me that my service will be accepted. But they may also have had some reservation about receiving this gift from the Gentiles. You know, it took a little while for the Jews to accept the Gentiles. Uh, they were unclean. Uh, they were the ones who rejected by God. And, um, you know, it, it took them a while before they could receive, uh, receive them as brethren. And we remember that in the book of Galatians, Paul talks about how even Peter, after a while, joined in the hypocrisy of the Jews and, and kind of withdrew from the Gentiles. That was a struggle for them. So he's saying, pray for me. Pray that they'll accept me. Pray that they'll accept this, this gift from the Gentiles. Uh, Paul asked them to pray if this was agreeable to God's will. Now, again, 
I think we're reminded when there is no specific promise that we can lay hold of in Scripture that we need to trust the matter to God. You know, I don't know if you, you know, remember this, but our Lord Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane when He's praying, I mean, He knew why He came into the world. He knew that He had to go to the cross, but it still seems that the, at, in those final moments, He's praying and asking, Father, if you are willing, let this cup pass. And He's not saying, if you're willing, let me off the hook so I don't have to go through this. But I think what He's saying is that if there's another way, other than my going to the cross, then let that happen rather than my having to drink this cup. But if there is no other way, give me the strength. So there's a sense in which when we don't know whether that particular petition is going to be answered, we do need to say, if you are willing, then please do this. So he's praying, if this is agreeable to God's will, Ask that I might be able to come to you, okay? That is, that Paul might be able to come to the Romans, that he may be delivered from the Jews and be able to make it to Rome as he's on his way to Spain, which we saw last week that he was eventually able to do, and to be able to come to them in joy, knowing that he had served the Lord and he had served the saints in this way and, and now would be able to serve the Romans, and to be refreshed with their fellowship, now again, interesting, the Apostle Paul needed something from the body of Christ. He needed their prayers, but he also needed their fellowship. He needed their encouragement. He needed to be strengthened and encouraged by their faith. No man is an island, not even Paul. <clears throat> James or John, I mean, the only one who was, I suppose, would be Christ. But even so, he enjoyed fellowship with his, with his brethren. But he had everything he needed from his fellowship with the Father. But I don't think anyone else does. We all need each other. We all need to be supported by each other's faith and fellowship. So Paul prayed. He asked the Roman believers to pray with him, to pray fervently, to pray heartedly by the power of the Holy Spirit in reliance on Christ's mediation, believing that God would answer his prayers according to his will, which we saw was not exactly the way that Paul was maybe thinking it would, it would happen, but the Lord still answered his prayer. And this reminds us that we also need to pray for each other with the same kind of fervency, heart, you know, hearty prayers to the Lord, with reliance on Christ and his mediation for them to be accepted always submitting our desires to God's will. I mean, we ask, and God answers, but He answers in His time and in His way. But let's pray that we might be fruitful in our service to Christ, even as Paul desired the prayers of the Romans, that he too might be fruitful. Now, finally, in this section, Paul closes with a benediction, which is a blessing or a petition from, you know, to the Lord that God, the God of peace, would be with them, that He would watch over them, that He would grant them protection and peace until He could come to them. Now, this, this is really what's behind the benediction, you know, as it's pronounced each week. It's, it's not just some perfunctory thing that's done, but it's actually a petition to the Lord uh, that He would bless us as our time of fellowship and worship is over, that He might keep us throughout the week so that we might gather again together for worship and encourage one another, that we might experience His blessing, you know, the one that we typically use in the evening, the Lord bless you and keep you and make His face to shine on you. I think we understand what that, you know, the, the, the countenance of God, the shining of His face to us is His face of blessing. We're asking for the Lord's blessing. So again, an encouragement to pray, that we might pray for God's blessing on each one of us so that we can be fruitful, so that we can be protected, so that we can experience God's blessing, which really, this is the path of blessing. Um, I think if you were to ask uh, the Apostle Paul or Peter or any of the apostles, and particularly those that were martyred for their faith, 
were they blessed? They were blessed more than we can possibly know through their suffering, through their hardships, and even through their death because the Lord, of course, would reward them richly for the things that they have endured for Him. Well, we need to pray. The prayer is not necessarily to make things easy. I mean, the prayer might actually bring difficulty, but if it's for God's glory, it will end in blessing. And that is um, giving glory to God is the most important thing. Uh, being blessed for giving Him that glory is, is important to us personally. So let's pray. Pray for one another that the Lord might do these things also uh, for us and use us. Well, let's, let's bow in just a moment of prayer.